It's fair to say that life was never easy for Richard Starkey. Born on the 7th of July 1940, deep within the Liverpool Dingle at 9 Madrin Street, Little Richie was born a month late and right in the middle of the Luftwaffe currently bombing Liverpool. His father, Richard Starkey Sr., was a baker, but unfortunately had lost interest in family life and moved away when Richie was only four, while his mother, Elsie, took up several jobs, including a barmaid at one of the local pubs to earn extra money on top of the 30 shillings that Starkey Sr. could afford to send a week. After moving across the street from Madrin Street to a smaller terrace house, 10 Admiral Grove, Richie seemed like a normal happy child, perfectly content with the little he and his mother had. His only regret was not having any brothers or sisters to play with. Richie was plagued by illness throughout most of his childhood. When he was six years old, he suffered a burst appendix, and after the doctors had had it removed, he contracted peritonitis, resulting in him falling into a coma for several weeks. Before he could be discharged, Richie fell out of his hospital bed, and he had to stay at Liverpool's Myrtle Street Children's Hospital for another 12 months. When he was finally let out in May 1948, it was discovered that, because he was so long in hospital, Richie was unable to read or write, so Mary Maguire, the daughter to his next-door neighbour, acted as a tutor to help him catch up for several years, and had become like a surrogate sister to Richie. By the time Richie was 11, Elsie had started a relationship with a house painter called Harry Graves, and the two got married in 1953. Richie attended Dinglevale Secondary School, as he wasn't eligible to sit the 11 plus exams which could grant him a place at a grammar school. But in 1953 he caught a cold, which then became tuberculosis, so he spent the next two years in a sanatorium. It was while he was in the sanatorium that Richie discovered his love for percussions. The nurses would often encourage their patients to get involved in activities to help motor activity, and Richie joined the hospital band, banging away on the cabinets next to his bed with a makeshift mallet. When he was finally let out in 1955, Richie had no aspirations or goals in life. Having spent so much of his time in hospital than in school, he couldn't even apply for a job, but thanks to the youth support system, he was able to find some employment. First, he worked as a messenger boy with the railway, but left after six weeks when they wouldn't give him a uniform, and then he worked as a barman. Thankfully, his stepfather, Harry, managed to get him an apprenticeship with an engineering firm, which, if he kept to, would set him up for life. But of course, that didn't happen. When the skiffle fad started in 1956, Richie was determined to be a part of it. Along with two of his friends, Roy Travard and Eddie Miles, they created Eddie Clayton and the Clayton Squares, where they performed along the same circuit as John Lennon's The Quarrymen. For Christmas 1957, Harry had bought his steps on his first drum kit, and this elevated Richie's stance as a musician and the appeal of Eddie Clayton and the Clayton Squares, until the skiffle fad ended in 1958. In 1959, Richie joined Al Caldwell's Texans, who were in need of someone who owed their own drum kit so that they could transgress to a full rock and roll band. The group had gone through several name changes before settling on Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. By the start of 1960, the Hurricanes were one of the most popular bands in Liverpool and were offered a contract to play at Butlin's Holiday Camp in Puleli in North Wales. Richie was reluctant to travel all the way to Wales and give up his engineering career, but Storm won him over when he suggested his own solo moment called Star Time. He had felt that Richard Starkey wasn't a suitable rock and roll name, and because the rest of the group had nicknamed him Ringo, because of the large assortment of rings he wore on his fingers, they decided that Starkey would be abbreviated to Star. It was when the Hurricanes went to Hamburg that Ringo first met the Beatles, and they instantly took a liking to him, with his quaffed hair, beard and moustache and pink suit, looking more professional than they did with their crumpled leather jackets and jeans. 
However, Rory, Storm and the Hurricanes began to hit problems from 1961 onwards. They weren't getting as many gigs as before, and Ringo were toy with the idea of giving up the musician lifestyle and emigrate to America to work in a factory and to be closer to the rock and roll and country music that he loved, like Hank Williams and Buck Owens, but got cold feet over the registration forms. During another boring summer gig with Butlins, this time in Skegness in 1962, Ringo received a phone call from John Lennon. Pete Best is leaving the Beatles. Do you want to take over as our drummer? The pay would be £25 a week, and all Ringo had to do was shave off his beard and moustache and comb his hair forward. Despite a troubled beginning from the angered Pete Best fans, Ringo was slowly accepted as part of the Beatles' sound. This is mostly due to his use of the drums. Because he is left-handed yet plays on a right-handed kit, Ringo's drumming pattern seemed unusual at the time. He would leave a gap between a verse or a chorus because he's leading the kit with his left hand and this gave the Beatles their distinctive sound. He also perfected a technique now referred to as the Ringo Swish, in which he would strike the slightly open hi-hat cymbal from left to right, as opposed to the traditional up and down style. While Ringo's drumming was spectacular, his vocal range was... limited. He accepted that he wasn't as good a singer or writer as John, Paul and George, and would have been perfectly fine to just be on the drums, but John and Paul insisted that he should have at least one song to himself on their albums and stage shows, so they would often give him a song that was suitable to his baritone range. When the Beatles became big in America, surprisingly the one who seemed to be the most popular was Ringo. The most successful piece of Beatles merchandise were the I Love Ringo badges, which outsold the other three badges, and Ringo became the inspiration and focus of several songs, including I Want to Kiss Ringo Goodbye by Penny Valentine, and Ringo for President by... Rolf Harris. Oh, that's awkward. This was also evident in their movies, where Ringo seemed to be the primary focus of them, which may be because he was the only one comfortable as an actor, and would of course try to make a movie career for himself. Due to his personal interest in photography, he acted as director of photography for their self-made film Magical Mystery Tour in 1967. Ludwig, the company that manufactured drums and percussions, got a surge of orders and demands simply because Ludwig was Ringo's preferred drum make, and they remained the highest manufacturers of drums until the 1980s. While there are people who say that Ringo is the weak link in the Beatles, being a mediocre drummer who got lucky, especially when compared to the likes of John Bonham and Keith Moon, consider this. If he really was as bad as you claim he is, then why didn't John, Paul and George just kick him out when they stopped touring and just used a session drummer? Debating whether or not Ringo is the best drummer in the world gets old fast, but the truth of the matter is is that he was certainly the best drummer for the Beatles.